You're listening to Travel Tales with Fergal. Hello, Fergal O'Keefe here and you're very welcome to the podcast. We can't physically travel right now, but there's nothing to stop us armchair travelling and hearing great travel stories. Today you are going to hear a very special interview with my very good friend Mark O'Halloran. Mark is an Irish actor, playwright and screenwriter of great renown from County Clare. He recently won two IFTAs for Best Screenplay for Rialto and Best Supporting Actor for The Virtues. You will know Mark as the star and writer of one of the best Irish films ever made, Adam and Paul. As you will hear now, Mark is a true gentleman who loves to travel off the beaten track. We talk about hiking the Camino, cycling the Lent of the Danube, exploring the Middle East, Cuba and Eastern Europe, talk of the excitement of going to international film festivals, to name just a few of the topics we cover. So, uh, welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thank you. Uh, great to see you. We go back a long way. We um, secondary school in Ennis in County Ennis. Clare. Because my my memory of my first memory of you in first year, we had an essay, and you read your essay, and yours was so good, it was like head down, don't ask, <laughs> don't ask me. I knew you were a good writer even then. Jeepers! The start it took of, me ages to get started on the writing. Though. That's what I was wondering. Like when you were writing that, know that you could write or. Well, like, I think one of the things that, and I think it is true, that, you know, when you're growing up in a place like Ennis, which is a small town that's in the west of Ireland, the idea that you would be a writer seemed like in, an insane thing. It always felt when, you know, when you also, when you studied writers in your English class, you know, they were, it always, they were always delivered to you as being like these exceptional people who were, who were born as writers sure. and everything they wrote down was an act of genius and they were recognized straight off and straight away and, and that, that was never who you were going to be. So I never thought that it would be a possibility. And also, this, I think there's, I think anybody who's tried to write or blah, 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 but there's a lot of nerves in putting down your early words because you feel like you're about to be cut out True. or that you've had a dream that's way beyond yourself and you do, cop yourself on now because what you're about to put down is, is a pile of rubbish. I kind of went the acting route and I, uh, you know, actors invent characters as much as writers invent characters. So I was kind of doing a bit of that. And then, but when it was 30, I was 30 when I wrote my first play. But you did, were you writing when you were in school, like a diary or something like that? Well, I do keep diaries and I have kept diaries Mm -hmm. for years and years and years. So I have a lot of stuff from when I was young, really young. So when I, in and around school, I'd be writing bits of poetry as everybody does. And uh, maybe a short story or two. I mean, they're really bad. Like, it's really interesting to look back at them. And even my diaries are hilarious from when I was like a teenager. Adrian Mole was a... It's unbearable. (laughs) And uh, and it's amazing how pretentious you were. But I mean, I... People give out about pretentiousness. But it's I part think, of it, isn't but it? But I think kids have to be pretentious. Oh, you have to pretend you want to be something. When was your first trip abroad then? So my first trip abroad was actually, I don't know whether you'd count London as being abroad, but it was a London a school tour when we were in sixth class. I, I probably was on the same one. That's what, That was my first trip abroad yeah. as well. Oh, was it? Yeah. I thought you had gone I mean, on holidays abroad. No, 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 no. We were exactly the same. We were... Okay. And your dad was always busy. With exactly. The, with he was a publican, so yeah. he's always working. So like our holiday was Le Hinch, and, you know, in a caravan. 20 minutes away so that was your first trip then would have been that school tour yeah school tour and I mean it was very I mean it felt like I'd never been away from home so it was part of it was being and staying in this really strange hotel that we stayed in and uh, it felt like a foreign place and then the, the next time I left Ireland was when I was like 19 and I went and I lived and worked in the Netherlands for a year I went to college for a while and I fell out of college and didn't get my exams and all of that and my uncle got me a job over in the Netherlands, um, near to Amsterdam. And so I lived and worked there for a year. But I remember the strangeness of, of being in a, a properly foreign country. Yeah, it's different. It's like everything, you know, their plug points and their, it felt like their doors opened differently or <laughs> like I found it. Did and, you like it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you like that feeling, you know, that uncomfortable <laughs> feeling when you're away and I go I to do, a new place? I love it. And a part of that, the thing with the with the Netherlands was that, you know, I was there alone. My my uncle lived down in Dan Haag, so I'd see them, I'd go and visit them sometimes. But I was there on my own, basically. And you could be whoever you wanted to be. True. 
you know, and you know, at the time I was kind of coming out of the closet and blah 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 and working my way through that. And that was where, you know, you were able to start calming your own head down about that shit. And but I remember I walked into a gay bar when I was there, which is kind of funny. Cause in was, Amsterdam, in was Amsterdam, Amsterdam yeah. yeah. And I'd never been in a gay bar before. And I'd never, I'd never really known anybody else gay, really. I, I'm, I did. I, at the time, I know now that I did, <laughs> but I didn't know. They, they, didn't, they hadn't introduced me, themselves to me at that, at that point. And I walked into this bar and I was like, I don't know, 19 years of age and wearing a terrible jacket. <laughs> <laughs> like I really looked well I looked really Irish like yeah. I remember when somebody somebody told me that when the, the Berlin Wall fell uh, is, is, somebody said that Berlin you could tell who was from the east because they dressed the way Irish people did <laughs> that was kind of really funny it was, somebody said it on the BBC <laughs> News or something like that but I, I obviously wasn't wearing the cool clothes that all the people who were hanging around uh, in Amsterdam were and this I obviously looked a bit shocked because this, uh, this English guy who was also there at the, at the weekend, he went, are you all right, mate? And I turned around to him and I said, are all these people gay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of funny. But like that idea of, and it's one of the things about travel that I really like, is that the farther you travel away from the place that you live or the place that you're from, the, m- the more of yourself falls away in exactly. a kind of a way. So you become less burdened by yourself. So you can just stand there and observe and watch and talk to people and not feel that, oh, they know my sister's uncle's, I don't know, yeah. half-cousin, or you just, you're just being. Do you, you know, say over the years travelling, does it affect where you go as a gay man? Well, I was once, I once toyed with the idea of writing this book called I Fuck You Travels Through Homophobia <laughs> and I made a list of the 20 most homophobic countries in the world and I kind of I pretty much went to all of them I would say <laughs> so there was like Russia and one stuff, but I went to Iran I went to Yemen I went to Syria I went to the Lebanon um, China was in there wow. a lot of the Eastern European countries as well uh, Turkey I went to Turkey uh, just to figure out what gay life was like in these places. Yeah. And um, it was kind of an eye-opener, you know. How you might we? Well, like, the reason I went to Iran was in, I, I think it was like 2007 or something, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was on television in Columbia University in the United States. He made this visit to the UN, and then he visited Columbia, as far as I know. And they asked him about gay rights over there, and he said there was no gay people in, in, in <laughs> Iran. And I was like, I'm going to check that. Yeah. I'm going to check where the gays are in Iran. And so I went there and spent about six weeks wandering around Iran. There's loads of gays there. You, you, I, you've told me before a story about coming off the plane. So I made kind I of love like a few people uh, online saying, you know, doing a bit of investigations, what happens in the gay world or how dangerous or how not dangerous and blah, blah, blah. And I got chatting with a couple of guys and they said, look, we'll collect you from the airport and we'll bring you to... To a, to a party we'll throw you a party for, for arriving there and they arranged for me to stay in various hotels that I was there and I was like cool grand and when we were flying into Tehran they announced that you're in uh, Iranian airspace and all the women in the plane suddenly started putting on the chador and the their hijabs and I was like okay <laughs> this is getting a bit serious now <laughs> and I was like I hope the lads are kind of really you know low key when, when, when I get to the airport and when you get to the airport you go through you know, and for the when you're not used to seeing all women in shadours, it's suddenly it is an eye opener. You go, oh, okay, this is this really is a different world. And there's this wall of glass that you face as you come out of customs, and you have to change your money and blah blah blah. And then you see the public are waiting there for all their relatives coming in, and there were the three guys who were waiting for me, <laughs> with basically wearing Amy Winehouse hair and going, <laughs> hi! And being as calm as knickers and I was like, I'm going to die. Yeah. So there was me and the three lads. So I was in the front of the taxi when we got a taxi and, uh, and the three lads as calm as knickers in the back and then this taxi driver who said to me, uh, where are you from? I said, I'm from Ireland. He said, I've never heard of it. And I said, yeah. And he was looking in his mirror at the guys behind there and he goes, do you like music? And I said, yeah, I like music. I'll play some music for you, he said. And he stuck on a Mariah Carey CD. <laughs> <laughs> there I was, travelling through northern Tehran. That was a tester. <laughs> it was like, 
four gays and a taxi driver at Mariah Carey. And, uh, thing. and we went to the, a party that night and there was drag queens at the party. There was alcohol at the party. Iran is surprising in loads of ways because everything is indoors, in homes. And in the outdoor realm, women cover up and everyone is being very modest. But inside, you have your family. The women take off their coverings. They, stuff goes on, you know. Normal life goes on. I've heard that, like so. The, kind of like the g- girls get dressed up and it's in their house and jeans and yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. it's cover up to go out. It's and they're lovely people. I've heard. Like I'd oh, love I to mean, go there. Absolutely, there. I met so much friendliness, and I met a guy in this town called Isfahan, and his wife and himself. They were looking at me because I had my guidebook out, and they came over and said, "You know, are you okay? Are you lost or anything?" And I said, "No, I'm just trying to figure something out." And he goes, "Where are you from?" And I said, "Ireland." And he was like, "Oh my god." I've waited so long to meet an Irish person. And uh, it turns out he was privately tr- uh, translating Ulysses into Farsi in his house. So he said, will you come to dinner with me and my wife? And I, they were a little bit younger than me, actually. And uh, I said, sure, but I can't do it tonight. And I said, I'm going away for a couple of days. So I'll be back next Thursday. And they said, yeah, well, I'll pick you up in a taxi from your hotel. So there he was waiting for me that Thursday. And, and, and I got into the taxi to go back to his place and... and uh, and he said, I have a list of questions. Do you mind if I start? And I said, no. And his first question was, who is the Lady Gregory? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, this is so weird. There was, there was a lot of Irish literary history that I had to wing. I was going, yeah, yeah well, Lady Gregory <laughs> yeah. was... Uh, She's a park somewhere. Uh, but then uh, he then said, you know, do, you know they, they brewed their own wine. And, you know, we sat around and had this feast. She cooked this mad vegetarian feast for me because she knew that I was vegetarian and like incredible kindness and generosity. And I'm still in contact with them. I, I, I emailed him and his wife every... She was a miniaturist. She painted camel bone miniature uh, miniatures and he is this literary guy. And is it a beautiful country? Like Parts of it are. Historic. Tehran is, is a mess. Like it's a huge, 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 huge city with like it's urban sprawl. But then there's, the city of Isfahan is very famous. It's, uh, they say Isfahan is half the world. If you see Isfahan, you've seen half the world. And the most extraordinary mosques and like the tile work. And it's just beautiful. There's other places like Shiraz, where the wine grape came from. The, the morality police dug up all of the, the, the vines and everything and destroyed it all. So, And you know, like from work... Um You've pretty gone to loads of festivals, yeah. like so yeah. you would have done. A, and do you like those? The festivals can be brilliant. I mean, when I first started going to festivals, it's the sheer excitement of it. But it wears off pretty quickly because they're actually kind of boring things. You have to do interviews or you have to try and flog the film. And, and it's just you wake up in a, in a hotel and you have to go to your premiere and you're there for two days and then you go home. Um, but the very first film festival I ever went to was to Berlin actually and I had never been to Berlin at that time and I just loved Berlin I just thought Berlin was fantastic but then I went to all sorts of other different festivals I went to to Moscow and uh, uh, of course Ken I met you at Ken I met you at Ken exactly you had a control explosion down your luggage exactly um, I uh, that, that was so funny like I, I must just tell people because it was um when I went, I just happened to be going on holidays. Yes. So I flew into Nice and our flight was late. So I had to go straight to Ken in a taxi. And I left Emer with the three kids, really young, yeah. at the airport. And then went, partied, had a wonderful time in Ken. And I remember waking up the next day, just leveled, no phone. Luckily, I bumped into Ed Guiney, the producer. Yeah. It was, the, it was the, actually, it was, it was the garage. Garage it was, was being premiered. Was, and... Um, which was Lenny, which obviously yeah. normal people fame now. And uh, I remember asking Ed for a lend of his phone. I had to ring Emer, <laughs> who was in Central Bay. So I got a train there and then I arrived into the house and I arrive into a room and I go, where's my bag? And Emer's like, you've got your bag. And I, I assumed Emer was going to take it <laughs> innocently with all the other bags. And it was, Emer rang the airport and all I heard was boom. That was the only, you know... So they'd blown it up, controlled explosion. And then when we got, when we were coming home, I went into Lost and Found and they came out with this big plastic see-through bag with all my clothes <laughs> burnt to a crisp. Well, I remember you also said to me that you'd spent the rest of your holidays wearing I Love Nice t-shirts. Exactly. <laughs> That's all. I Love Nice, like, you know. <laughs> 
So yeah, swings and roundabouts. I lost all my clothes, but I did get to go to premiere at the Cannes Film Festival, your movie. And I got to see a bit of your life. Like there's a rooftop party in a hotel after the premiere. And then we went to a pool party up in the mountains afterwards in a villa. So yeah, quite amazing. But I've also been to festivals like in America, Telluride, which was kind of amazing up in Colorado mountains, which is kind of a, a brilliant place. And to Seville, to um, to all sorts of places, Ljubljana, that I wouldn't have ever gotten to, those kind of out-of-the-way festivals, um, which I, I kind of, I really like. I, I choose them more than the kind of, the, the flashy ones make you work for your, for your keep, whereas the smaller ones you just hang around. Um, and then there was, uh, I, last year, we went to Venice for the Venice Film Fest. Was that, that was for Rialto. Real- that was Rialto was, was, but I had never been to Venice before, so that was kind of like. What do you think of Venice? Well, like it's very crowded, and I'm, uh, but it is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Like it really is beautiful. I, I thought it was amazing. We were staying out in the Lido, so getting the boats into the city every day. and I mean, it is kind of really extraordinary. I found it eerie at night time. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Kind yeah, of walking yeah, in. Yeah, it is a little, yeah. you know. I, I also, then, the year before last, I spent six months going over and back to Rome. I made a TV series. I acted in a TV series in Rome. And so I got to live in Rome for quite a long... And Rome is amazing. Yeah. I mean, the history there and the culture... Italians are and the way they they live. You know, I love the, I love the way they breakfast in their local patisserie place and like a little a little, a little dessert little, for breakfast. Yeah, a little dessert for yeah. breakfast and a little coffee and and it's a brilliant city to walk around. Um, you know, you could walk forever um, in in Rome. It's one of my favorite cities yeah, in the world. It's Anywhere in Italy, yeah. where would you pick if there was a country that you had to go? That's that's my favorite. Do you have a favorite? Well, I dream of Havana a lot. Yeah. I just love, I love being there. And I feel really at home there, actually. Um, I, I, I may be tied into the fact that we, we had um, Cuban refugees in Ennis true. in the late 80s, early Very 90s. true. Do you remember that? And it was yeah. like the music and the dance and yeah, everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. We thought there was going to be a load of Cubans and the Claire Hurling team. That we were <laughs> they left very quickly yeah. when they got a chance. Strangely. They left Ennis, that beggars. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a place that I, I really love. Like, had you you've been there, you've been there so many times, I haven't you? Met, no, I, I hadn't had been. You? So it was, I didn't go there until, might have been 2007, 2006. And myself and Paddy Brannock went over there and he had been going there for quite a while. And he wanted to make something in Cuba, but he didn't know what it was that he wanted to make. Oh, okay. But he said that the drag world there was really interesting. And, uh, and I was going, yeah, straight guy who loves the drag scene. <laughs> Bloody hell. So we went out there and we met loads of drag queens and blah, blah, blah. And I, there was sort of similar types of stories were coming at you. Lots of these effeminate boys having problems with their dads and all of that sort of thing. And uh, I wrote a one-pager sort of outline of a story for Paddy. And he said, yeah, I really like that. So we'll go with that. So then I went back there for an extended period. So I went back there for like three months or something. And I, I just basically lived a normal life there. I, I went to the drag shows every day and hung out with drag queens. <laughs> and, uh, so did you fall in love with the place? Then. I mean, I my very first trip to Cuba, I didn't particularly enjoy it. Why is that? There's something I felt that we were very much on display. We were staying in quite a nice rest uh, uh, hotel, and I felt that the people were co- seeing you coming in and out, and so there'd be lots of scams going on. And do you want to buy this? Do you want to buy cigars? Do you want? And I just got tired of it after a while. I was like, oh. But then the Cubans are kind of really interesting. When they'll come up to you and they'll try and sell you stuff on the street and blah blah, and you just go, no, I'm not interested, you know. And they're really cool about that. Whereas you feel, because you're Irish sometimes, you feel like, oh, I have to buy it now because I said hello to him. <laughs> oh, yeah. That kind of stupid stuff. You're buying shit cigars, yeah. and, like fake Don't cigars smoke. on people suddenly. And you're going like, why am I doing that? Um, and I found it a bit overwhelming, I think. And I wasn't, I wasn't in the greatest headspace at the time I went over there that first time. So I was dreading going over the second time for that extended period. But then I really got to love it. I mean... So they probably sensed off you as well that you... You're, you know, I, that you were, I, I you'd gone I, past the tourist thing, you know. And I kind of was living in this, I lived in this, this gay B&B in the middle of Havana and it was the fucking funniest place I've ever been to. Uh, it was like a Mexican soap opera um, every day. It was just hilarious. 
And I met loads of really lovely people who were struggling to get by and trying to be performers or trying to get off the island. Or And every day there was a bit of drama going on and people sitting around tables chatting. And, and uh, I got to just hang out with people and go to their houses and have dinner. And I watched the way that they'd, you know, the way they'd make food or deliver food to people or... Because for a lot of people, they're living hand to mouth over there, and um, and want is kind of is very it's very real, you know. You were there recently, weren't you? Were so there? I was there uh, last autumn because uh, my partner's Cuban, so I was over there trying to improve my Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I go there as often as I can. So have you noticed a big difference then? In, that's ten years. Yeah, I mean, there is a big difference, but like you could say the same about Ireland. True. You know, every place changes, and I but, think the one thing about Cuba is that. Cuba changes all the time. Yeah. In what way? Well, there's always, the government is always moving and shape-shifting and, you know, there's, there's a black economy that keeps the whole country afloat. And always was, I'd say. And always was. So people are... You but know, Americans are able to go there now. No, not anymore. Why are they not? Because uh, Trump rode back on Obama's agreement uh, with the Cubans. An interesting fact, I, I read yesterday that Trump is leading in Florida... With Latinos with and or Cubans, it's, is that it's what, the Cuban Latinos? Because they're 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 really really conservative. People. Yeah, I can understand. Uh, that. And I think they weren't quite happy with the way that Obama made some sort of uh, peace with the with the regime over there, and so they want to make sure it doesn't happen again. It's a pity because <clears> I, I presume that was would have been great for their economy. Will get going if they can. Well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of the really older Cubans in Miami have never been back or they would be born to families that they don't go back but the younger people come and go all the time from Miami or <clears throat> you know I met quite a lot of Cubans who now were like oh yeah I was living in in Houston for for three years but I'm back now I, I, I just wanted to take a year back in at home and la 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 there's more of a porous feel like it used to be an absolute dogmatic um, political divide and that's kind of going a little bit okay could you live there i would love to live there yeah, yeah is it yeah. possible or it can we you, not 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 really you have to you have to jump through a lot of hoops and you have to get married and they don't have gay marriage there so that's kind of okay. uh, cut off to you so um it would drive you mad though like the system would drive you mad like for instance even just the internet they're not allowed to have private internet coverage in their houses so you're not allowed to have your wi-fi in your house but on the street the government provides hot spots in all the parks and all the city parks in various locations in the city so if you want to use the the internet you get your internet card for a dollar or whatever and you go and you sit with your laptop in the local park and you log on and or do they think you could be less up to you know, anti-government well, activity in a park than I at home. I think that some of that might be part of it, but also they've got very little bandwidth okay. in the worldwide True. web. And they only have it because Venezuela gave it to them. Uh, and it's it, like it's much more prevalent now than it, than it used to be. Um, and just out of interest, have you been to other countries like uh, Caribbean or South America? I've been to Jamaica and... and how do uh, they compare? Is it, is I mean, they're very different. Are they're they? very different. They, uh, uh, I found Jamaica quite edgy. and uh, But Havana feels as if it's edgier than it is. Yeah. Uh, but it's a really, you know, it's a very safe place. It's very beautiful with those old kind of It is, 50s. and it's falling, to, it's falling apart. Is it? Like, it is falling apart. So some of it is just in squalor and decay and but then there's an amazing things in it like there's amazing things in it but it's really really like i've never known tourists to be attacked or blah blah no but then the people are hilarious over there like they're really they're very free-spirited people very highly educated they're all on the make you know they're all you know, and are they cool you know the way you said like they don't have marriage but are they okay they're but there is a gay culture there, isn't I mean, there, there? Is a very They're quite obvious, open, is it? Yeah, and and there, I mean, there. It's quite a macho culture. So, if you if you go into the countryside, it's maybe not as as uh, as acceptable as it is in Havana. In Havana, they're all cool with it. And there's you know the state-run drag club yeah. that they. Oh, is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Called Las Vegas. Las Vegas. 
Um, and so they're, they're kind of, they're very, they're, they're, you know, Mariela Castro, who is the granddaughter of, no, she's the niece of Fidel because right. she's Raul's daughter. And she is in charge of the uh, Department of Sexual Health. And she has campaigned for gay rights, for transgender rights, for blah, blah. And she's been really, really proactive. And one of the last public speeches that uh, that Fidel ever gave was to apologize for the way he treated gay people. Wow. And he accepted full responsibility for what they did. Because they didn't, you know, they, they treat people pretty bad. Where is your favorite weekend trip or your favorite city trip? I don't particularly like just doing a weekend in a place because I feel you never get the handle on something. And so I used to find that upsetting because I'd go like, I'll never know that place. Like, I don't yeah. even know whether I went to the, the best places there. So I like to take a, a time with a place. Yeah. I go there for, for a length of time that feels good, you yeah. know. Um, I, went, I went to Seville uh, two years ago and I'm more, like my memory of it is more all the places I didn't go to yeah. than what I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like guilt. And I keep going, I need to go back yeah, and see. It's kind of nice, actually. It's amazing. it's amazing. Yeah. I was there for a film festival thing and uh, they showed you around and uh, I just loved it. Oh, it was spectacular. It was great. It felt like real Spain, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I remember like eating tapas at like midnight and then we went to this display of flamenco dancing and I remember the guy come, came out on stage and he had like brill creamed hair very curly and I I laughed because I thought this is going to be really cheesy and then it was fucking amazing and then the woman came out and she danced with her shawl and all that and I was like yeah. it was extraordinary I, I, one of the things that I do nowadays like rather than do a weekend in a place if I want to get away for a weekend I go to a place that I really love for like the four or five days but sometimes I plan longer escapades so like one of the things I did the Camino Frances, which loads and loads and loads of people do, but I really enjoyed doing it actually. So how, how long was that? How much? How long did you walk? Well, you go from inside the French border, so it's in this place called Saint Jean de Pied de Port, and then you go all the way to to. Did you do the whole thing? I did the whole thing, wow. and then onwards to Finisterre afterwards. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, it is. How long did that take you? Thirty-four days in total. But I stopped a few times. Like, there's some brilliant cities that you go through, like Leon and uh, Pamplona and. Uh, Borgas and all those these really beautiful medieval type cities and uh, there's a lot of it the middle of it is this place is this area called the Meseta and it's really uh, isolated and blah blah you just walk every day and getting up and knowing all you have to do is walk and it is gorgeous I love that it's really peaceful and beautiful it's, it's and very I find it um, you know like that word pilgrimage but mm -hmm. it it's it's the clearing the head and just one foot in front of the other yeah, and you yeah, end yeah. up thinking of nothing you know I find after I a few used to days think a lot about the pains in my feet yeah. and I, I had blisters on my blisters I lost both my big toenails uh, I mean it was a, at times it becomes hellish like because it's fine anyone can walk 25 or 30 kilometers in a day but when you do it every day for a length you suddenly your tendons are really sore and you've got shin splints and all that so like, your focus like, every day in the morning I'd be like fuck this fucking <laughs> Everyone at peace and me fucking yeah. you know, rumbling out of my breath. But then I did this other thing as well where I uh, cycled the length of the Danube. Wow. Which was amazing. Wow. Amazing. So you start in this little town called Danaueshing and in, it's near where, the, where France, Switzerland and Germany meet and it's the official birthplace of the Danube. And you cycle all the way to the Black Sea. Um, and you go through... How long is that? That... That you cycled? I did about... Uh, I did it about seven years ago but the length the length it? is oh, I, mean, I don't know exactly how long it is it would have to be two and a half thousand wow. kilometres is it really two thousand kilometres wow two thousand oh maybe I'm I'm no. completely made up I did a hundred kilometres a day when I was cycling but then wow. I took lots of days off along the way yeah. and that took me about 35 36 37 days but that wasn't cycling every day so like because you go through cities like Linz uh, Vienna uh, Bratislava, Budapest, um, see, uh, Constanza, all of these amazing uh, places. And I did it in a kind of a September time, so it was getting towards autumn and the place was, cl was, was really getting... Uh, the, 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 the farther east you went, it was getting colder and colder. But it was really, I would highly recommend it. But uh, you, you do get to see amazing cities. Like, I really... 
I grew to love Budapest. I'd been to Budapest once and then I cycled and I stayed about two, two or three days in Budapest. And I've, I've gone back to Budapest a lot. It's a, it's a fantastic cultural city. I mean, it's so beautiful. It's, the, the, the architecture of it is extraordinary. I mean, uh, the politics there is a bit messy, but uh, Budapest is this weird liberal elite in the middle of a, quite a conservative country, you know. Yeah. Around that area ish is uh, Albania. You were in Albania as I well. I was in Albania because I, I had been, <clears throat> I mean, that's, I haven't been to Albania for about 12 years, but I was there. I made a film in Kosovo. So I was in Kosovo for about three and a half months or four months. And they're ethnic Albanians. And so I went back to do a few pickups and then I went into Albania via the uh, Kosovo. So at the time, there's now a super highway there, but at the time it was literally hairpin turns up and down a mountain range to get into to Tirana. Um, and there weren't, I mean, there weren't many tourists, but it was absolutely beautiful place to, to visit. So it was still a very closed country at that stage, It was wasn't still it? very closed, yeah. I mean, they were in the aftermath of, like, their their entire government collapsed in about, in the 90s. Yeah. So this was this was still only about ten years on from that. So, um, what's it like? Like, is it is it like Greece type? Like, is it you know? I mean, the, as in the it depends on which when you're in. I mean, they're obviously they're a very distinct culture and uh, uh, Tirana. There's a lot of the communist architecture is still around there, which is fascinating. I'd say. Which is fascinating, and the story of Hadja and and what he did to his people is kind of is fascinating, and. Uh, and then you go down the coastline and you, you, you get to the, an Ionian coastline, which is exactly the same as the Ionian coastline in Greece, except there's no hotels. And there's, the, you leave a town uh, called Vlura and you, literally you turn around a bend and you, you see just this coastline that goes all the way down, heading wow. towards Greece. And it is absolutely, it's so beautiful. And where do you stay then? Do you... Well, I used to rock into these, like... I was going on buses to get there because I, you know, I can't drive, so I, I couldn't hire a car or anything like that. So you'd rock into a town, and they'd be like, "What are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't have hotels, but <laughs> your man might put you up in his, in his, and he might have, have a, a room, a room in his, you know, a B and B or blah blah blah." And then we made it. I, I, I was joined by friends when I got to this place called Saranda, and Saranda is, uh, it's their basic, it's basically their version of Kilkee. Um <laughs> And that was kind of really interesting. Like it was slot machines and was candy floss, and it felt like a, a, a really amazing resort. But Corf, Corfu is just across the, the, the straits; it's right there in front of you. And then we went back, and I travelled into Macedonia, then over Lake Arad. Lake Arad is just incredibly beautiful, and I, I have I've spent a good bit of time in Macedonia. An amazing city. Um, again, it's kind of this mess of post uh, post communist architectural brutalism. The the city, the, the city of Skopje, is split in two. So one half of it is Albanian, ethnic Albanian, and the other is the ethnic Macedonian Slavic people, and they don't particularly <laughs> like each other. And on one side, there's a big hill overlooking the Macedonian side, and they've got this big, huge cross that lights up at night. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> it's such a provocation, though. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I mean... Like, is there a border between, like, is it all within Macedonia, but ethnic, or is it actually two separate countries? No, it's, no? it's the one country. Macedonia okay. is the one country. So the, the only thing that splits the city is the river. So you just go across the bridge, and but suddenly you're in a, an ethnic, ethnic wow. Albanian... Um, part of the city and then you know you can take a taxi from Skopje and you're suddenly in Thessalonica it's an amazing part of the country like around there I isn't mean, it I mean it's just when I was making the film there the interesting thing was that was in Kosovo yeah really? the depths of hatred there are just you know we think we know it from the north and all of that but it's, it's and really mean, deeply we, ingrained so who would that be then is it like so is it the Kosovan Muslims so the, 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 the Albanians Christ are Muslim or I mean they're largely secular but mm -hmm. um, and then the the Slavic Christians or the Eastern Orthodox Christians are there, and they just they don't particularly like each other. Yeah. And, and but it's been like they've been having battles for centuries. Yeah. Um, but it even comes down to the fact that you know there's a documentary that was made in the region, and it's this woman who goes around collecting folk songs, and she plays a folk song which is an Albanian folk song for Serbians, and they go, "That's our fucking song. That's our song. They stole it from us." And she'll play the Serbian version for the Albanians, and they go, "That's our fucking song. They stole our culture. Look what they did." It's just it goes back generations and generations yeah. and generations. But then the landscape around there, 
I mean, they're living in this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful yeah. place. I know. We did some filming up in the Rugova Mountains, which are between um, between Albania and Kosovo, and it's just incredibly beautiful, like really beautiful. And is it the same thing, like Albania, like it, like it's not geared up for tourists, like is it? Well, no. I mean, there's a certain instability in in Kosovo still, and there there's the, they have a huge. Um, population drain at the moment people going into eastern western europe rather than staying and they they still have nothing has been sorted out between them and the serbs and and actually do do you find that um when you're traveling like places like that inspiration for writing well you do i mean you, inspiration for writing comes from everyday life i mm. think you know you just watch people and listen to people when you go to somewhere like Kosovo, because we were making this film and we were working with the ethnic Albanians there, like it's 90% of, or even more of, of Kosovo is now Albanians, but you found yourself taking sides, you know, even though you yeah. know nothing about the conflict. <laughs> you kind of go, yay, come on, there's, come on, the Albanians. So that was kind of a, a, an odd one. But I mean, normal things, you know, just watching people in a normal ways. You remember you told me before you went to Syria? Yeah. So was that around that time? No, was that was before. That was before I went to Iran. So that was kind of an interesting one. I, I travelled down from Istanbul all the way down through Turkey, and then I walked across the the Turkish border into into Syria. Got a taxi when I got inside the border. After I would walked across the border, and I went to the town of Aleppo, the city of Aleppo. Which I mean, it was amazing. It was really amazing. It's all 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 gone now. I just had my my card and my credit card, thinking oh, I'll just get some money out of the ATM. But of course. Syria was locked out of the, the the World Banking Service because they were a pariah nation. So I was like, why the fuck do I get money? But in the, the there was always a, a Four Seasons or something like that that would have an international bank machine in there. So you had, to, you had to stay close to larger towns when I was in there. I didn't bring any money with me. Interestingly enough, people like to, you know, especially somewhere like Syria or Iran, they like to, to say that it's monolithically, you know, conservative. And when I was in Syria, I stayed in this beautiful hotel in Aleppo which was inside the old city the old wall city which is completely destroyed now and there was a souk there which is like this it was just hundreds of years old of these little alleyways and little shops and uh, it was the most Middle Eastern place I'd ever been to at the time I like it was very different to Turkey even you know which is very European in many ways I left my hotel and I was a bit kind of like Jesus where am I and this guy comes over and says where are you from I said I'm from Ireland and he said do you know the Mr. Oscar Wilde? And I said, yeah. And he said, I am like the Mr. Oscar Wilde. And I said, really? And he goes, yes, I am a vegetarian. <laughs> and I said, I'm a vegetarian too. And then he said, I think we understand each other. And I was going, this code is fucking out of control. <laughs> Classic. This is the worst code I've ever heard. But he brought me to his uncle's shop. And his uncle's shop was the campus man he he was the uncle was the campus man I'd ever met in my whole life and he owned this shop which was called the Mr. Oscar Wilde shop and it he sold pashminas and scarves and uh, silks and to all the, the ladies who were passing through but the walls of the shop were plastered in pictures of Oscar Wilde and nobody seemed to bat an eyelid and all of the the very flamboyant gays of, of Aleppo used to hang out there and it was kind of outrageous that they were outrageous and they would bring me to parties at night and then they told me where I had to go when I got to Damascus, which were the good the <laughs> places, you know, the, that you'll find the gays hanging around. And uh, so there was this, there's this really weird, vibrant underworld that was going on there. I mean, I, you know, you, you just, you, 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 you shudder to think what, what happened to many yeah. of those people that I met. What's know? Damascus like? Is it a... Damascus I loved. I absolutely loved it. Um really vibrant it's a very, it's it's quite a mixed city in that there's quite a large um christian population there and there's so so not all of the women are covered there used to be a, a sizable jewish population there as well not maybe not so much anymore you know re, there's an armenian community there the, the the armenians are famous for 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 owning jewelry shops and selling gold and all of that and um, and I just loved hanging around there, you know. That's tough now because those countries are hard to go to now. Aren't I mean, they? Syria, they were on my you list. Can't and, go. Yeah, and Syria know? was was. I mean, I was longing to go back there, and but mm. the, the, the the conflagration just began to get worse. And, and there's worse and kind worse. of old Crusader castles and stuff there as well, isn't Crack, there? 
De Chevalier, yeah. it's called. Yeah, which is amazing. And then know. Palmyra's there as well. And, you know, you can drive on a bus from Damascus to, to Beirut, you know, which wow. I did, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. Because um, Beirut, you think, you've heard so much about the city. Again, it's a city that's going through awful pain at the moment. Yeah. And what about Istanbul? Istanbul, I love. I mean, I've been to Istanbul quite a lot. I once took the, the overnight train from Thessalonica to Istanbul, the sleeper train, which is kind of an amazing... I like trains yeah. anyway, and it's kind of a great. You always meet people, don't you? On trains, you meet and you're sleeping there. You got your little, your little bed, and you wake up and you're suddenly in the middle of Istanbul. And Istanbul is just so vibrant; it's an electrifying place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I really like Turkey anyway. You know, did you like have a tradition when you were young <clears throat> for holidays? Say, did you, you know, were you going away in Ireland for? family holidays we never or? went abroad uh, because of so many of us like there was five bro- I have five brothers and four sisters of course and uh, my dad wouldn't you know he'd have been working in the P&T and my mum worked in a betting office so there wasn't a huge amount of money around so what we did do though we always my dad had a caravan that he bought and we literally the first day we finished school uh, uh, at summertime we were driven to the caravan and it was either when I was very young it was in Carrigaholt way 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 out west near to near enough to loop and uh, and then when i was about 10 or 8 or 9 or 10 they moved it to spanish point so spanish point and milton malbay were where we went and we would spend two and a half months down in spanish point wow and i mean i used to just love it because you got away from ennis and i mean we never went back to ennis you know when we were on their holidays and we we lived went to the beach every day or you know, helped farmers doing, you know, bringing in hay, or it was big adventures. And then when you were later in your teens, there was teen romances, and there was maybe taking the first drink, or you know, there was all of that sort of stuff went on, and it was all done in the summertime. Summer times were kind of magical, I think. True, definitely. He used to say that he didn't want us hanging around the town during the summer. He thought that we we'd be getting into all sorts of trouble. But he also didn't like us to go to either Kilkee or Lahinch. Kilkee because it was full of Limerick people and. Lahinch because it was full of Venice people and you'd just be hanging around getting up to no good so he re- really Carrigaholt uh, and we were in a place called Ryan Villa which was even beyond Carrigaholt so they were like in the middle of absolutely nowhere and even the Spanish point where we were staying there was very few people around yeah. so he liked us to kind of it's still like that you yeah. know it's beautiful no. and you go back there now like or do you yeah, I have you know my mum still has a caravan down in um, Spanish Point so and my sisters have caravans down there and they go with their kids and uh, I occasionally if I'm down but I haven't been there for maybe two years but uh, it's it's kind of when you step into that landscape like the last time I went down there was maybe six or seven years since I'd been down there but you just get sort of overwhelmed with these memories of our sense memories of being a kid you know and um, you know the smells are really intoxicating or the little by roads that you'd walk down and you just knew all of the that thing that you were as a kid were were in that landscape it's kind exactly. of really interesting i was in the hinch last <clears throat> weekend and it's the same the minute i got out of the car just the salty air and the, and the, the noise of all places has changed you a know, huge amount. It has, it has. I mean, it's a surfer town. I know. <laughs> it's like California, except cold. My last question is always, is like your happy place when you, if you take three deep breaths, as Emer would say, where would you, where is your happy place to Well, think there's to? the beaches, uh, Playa del Este, outside of Havana. Um, just miles of unspoilt beach front with this pale blue sea like it's just gorgeous palm trees palm trees no hotels um people come out from the city in buses and and swim there during the day um, and it's just phenomenal phenomenal i love it brilliant thank you very much for thank you mark i appreciate yeah. that thank you <laughs> <laughs> it's great i would ask if you could please subscribe to apple podcast so a new episode will appear in your library every week I would also really appreciate if you could leave a rating and a review as it helps others to discover this podcast. To find out who's on every Tuesday, please follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Travel Tales with Fergal. Stay safe and keep dreaming of future travels. Travel Tales with Fergal.